Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Games Core. So one of the unexpected things about having this new YouTube channel is the amount of companies who reach out to me and ask me to review products of theirs. And to be honest, I'm kind of picky about which things I actually accept. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I genuinely just want to make a channel about retro video games. So if it doesn't have to do with that, then I'm typically not interested. But one of the things I am working on is getting a little bit better with Android gaming. This is not a space I'm very comfortable with. I've been using iPhones since 2008 at this point. And I have made a couple videos about Android gaming in particular, but I still have a lot to learn. And so when this company reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this phone that's very focused on gaming and we only want you to focus on that, I thought this actually might be a good opportunity for everybody. And so this phone is called the Blackview BL5000. And that may not mean anything to you. I'll tell you, it didn't mean anything to me. But one of the things that did interest me about it is that it uses a Dimensity chipset. And as you know, the Ein Odin recently went on Indiegogo and its light model, which is the one you see here, uses a Dimensity chip as well. So I thought it might be a good opportunity to try out this one and see how it performs in the context of the Ein Odin. So as always, we're gonna run it through its paces, talk about the things I like and don't like about it, and we'll just see what we discover on the way. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. What do you think? What do you think? Looks good? Whoa. Okay. So let's start with the price first. This is a $300 phone, at least right now. It does one of those things where it says it's $500 and they're giving you a discount, but I'm not really sure about that. I think this is really just a $300 phone. And this company specializes in what they call rugged phones. These are phones that are not meant to be used with cases. They basically have cases in and of themselves. And this is firmly a mid-range phone. It does have dual 5G and it has eight gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. So kind of all those baseline things you would expect from a modern phone. Now, as you scroll down, you're gonna see all sorts of marketing things. And some of these things don't really mean anything to me. But the first thing to highlight is the fact that it uses a Dimensity 700 chip. Now the MediaTek Dimensity chipsets recently came on my radar, mostly because the Odin Lite is going to be using a Dimensity 900 chip. And as you can see, the Dimensity 700 chip that's on this phone doesn't quite compare to the Dimensity 900, but at least for now, this is the closest I have on hand to at least do some theoretical comparisons of how Dimensity chips run in general when it comes to emulation performance based on the level of optimization for each of these emulators. You know, there's some other marketing things here. It says it uses liquid cooling technology as well as a dedicated game mode. We'll check that out here later. Now, one of the things I kind of found a little bit funny about this is that they actually market it towards people who are violent with their own phones. You can see here they have like damage proof in a rage of game loss or resistant to your wife's impulse mistake. So they're trying to show off that it's rugged and it can withstand abuse. But I don't know if you should highlight the fact that this is a phone for abusers. Anyway, moving on. And of course, this phone has a camera and all the other phone stuff. I'm not really going to get into that. So let's do a quick unboxing and see what the experience is like. So it's a fairly impressive setup. I did find it funny that it doesn't come with a US plug, but it's all good. Comes with a USB-C cable, a fairly in-depth written manual, and the phone itself. Here's a little bit of the stats for the phone. First impressions, this thing is pretty heavy. As you can see here, it's 268 grams. By comparison, something like the LG V20 is 196 grams, and that's with a case. Same thing with the Google Pixel 3, 166 grams with a case as well. So unpackaging it here, the second thing I noticed is just kind of this gaudy design here on the back. Obviously it has a triple camera setup. I'm not really sure what the rest is for though. And unfortunately this kind of sticks out a bit from the back as well. It's a little bit distracting. On the sides you have a volume and menu button. And on the bottom here, you can see it has a little waterproof covering for the USB-C port. Now, unfortunately, there is no space for an SD card, but there is a SIM card slot, and you can see here that it holds two different SIM cards. So you could use this for both a business and a personal line. And I think that's becoming more and more standard with new phones as they come out. Overall, the screen is relatively impressive. It's nice and big and looks like a modern cell phone screen. So turning it on, you're gonna have to do all the setup stuff that you would expect. But once you're in, you'll get to the main menu. Now, right off the bat, I could see that this is a very gamer-minded phone. Just the design itself is very kind of boxy and a little bit neon looking. I'm not a huge fan, but it is what it is. So if this is a gamer phone, let's turn it into an actual gaming device. First thing, I want to use my GameSir USB-C controller here. First thing I learned is that this little waterproof covering gets in the way. So I made an executive decision and decided to rip that thing out. I don't plan on throwing this thing in the ocean at any time, so I think it'll be okay. 
But the bummer is that it still doesn't fit with the GameSir controller. It's just too big. You actually cannot connect it into the device, which is a shame because in all other respects, it's a very nice fit. The screen is the exact width of the controller, so it blends in fairly nicely. But unfortunately, that's all moot if it can't connect. So if you didn't want to use a GameSir controller, I would recommend using a Bluetooth version instead of the USB-C one that I'm using here. But I'm not going to let that spoil our fun, so let's try out just a regular old Bluetooth controller. And as expected, it pairs nicely. I think this is Bluetooth 5.1. So next thing I did is I went onto the Google Play Store and downloaded a bunch of apps. Let's start with ADA64 to check out the system specs. So as we already knew, this has 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of internal storage. And sure enough, yeah, it has Bluetooth 5.1. In terms of CPU, we're working with eight cores here. Six of them are an ARM Cortex-A55 running at two gigahertz as well as two A76 cores with 2.2 gigahertz. In terms of the display itself, it's a 2300 by 1080 display, 6.36 inches altogether, with a pixel density of 400 dpi. It also has a refresh rate of 60 hertz. And I don't want to bore you with a bunch of these specs because you can check them out on the purchase page too, but the other thing I want to highlight is that it has a 5000 mAh battery. All right, so let's start testing out some gameplay here. We'll start with Horizon Chase, an Android game that's one of my favorites. And this game isn't super hard to run, but it is a really good test of Bluetooth latency. For me, a good measurement of Bluetooth is whether or not I forget that it's even a Bluetooth controller at all. And to be honest, it hit that wicket for me. So in terms of input lag, I was pleasantly surprised. Now, unfortunately, Genshin Impact does not have external controller support, but in general, I think the game looked pretty good. I think a lot of fans of this game appreciate it running at a higher frame rate. So at 60 hertz, to me, it looks nice, but to others, you may not like it. So moving on to emulation, let's start with PSP and let's do a three times resolution here. So a resolution of about 720p. And this is just running on the standard OpenGL graphics backend. And it's running relatively well, but not perfectly. I am detecting some slowdowns. So let's change the backend to Vulkan and see how that fares. And definitely I'm seeing better performance with Vulkan. I'm still getting a little bit of frame dips here and there, 59, 57, things like that. But in general, I think it's pretty good. You could also turn on auto frame skip and get rid of any of those issues, but it does result in gameplay that's not quite as smooth. Now most other PSP games besides OutRun 2006 play just fine at 3 times resolution, and I did find that Vulkan was the better graphics backend. So yeah, for the most part I think that if you want to play PSP, 3x resolution with the Vulkan backend is about the upper limit. You could try to push it to 4x, but I don't think you're going to like those results. So this is my first indication that it's a bit of a bummer. Because it's a 1080p display, I would really love it if it had 1080p rendering. But unfortunately, the CPU power just can't keep up with what the screen would be able to show you. God of War Chains at Olympus was basically unplayable at 3x resolution, but 2x resolution was just fine. A tiny bit of stuttering here and there, but for the most part, 2x resolution on God of War is probably your best bet. Okay, let's move on to a different emulator here. Let's try Redream, so Dreamcast emulator. Now, just off the bat, I'm gonna change the resolution to 1920 by 1440, and it's running at 60 frames, no problem. In general, I think you're gonna have pretty good Dreamcast performance, even running at this higher resolution. Even something like NBA 2K2, which I consider to be one of the hardest games to emulate on the Dreamcast, is running just fine. Now granted, there are plenty of other phones that can play Dreamcast fine as well, but this was definitely a bright spot as I was reviewing this device. Okay, let's move on. How about Nintendo 64? Let's change the display settings to 1440 by 1080. And again, no problems here. So just like Dreamcast, I think that you could push this one to the limits and you're not going to have any problems. Honestly, even trying GoldenEye 007, it still was definitely playable at 1080p. Now, I never really grew up playing this game, so I'm not a great judge of how this is supposed to be running, but for the most part, to me, it seemed like smooth gameplay. And you gotta love that 90s style AI, it's just like shooting fish in a barrel. Either way, I don't think Nintendo 64 is gonna be a problem on this phone. Okay, moving on to something a little bit more challenging, let's try Nintendo 3DS via the Citra emulator. And as you can see here, unfortunately, even running at a native resolution, it's basically unplayable. And Metroid Samus Returns is one of the easier games to play. If you try something harder like Super Mario 3D Land, you can't even get through the cutscene. And you would think something like Tetris would at least play pretty well and maybe a little bit slower so it would make it an easier game. But no, it's unplayable. 
All right, let's move over to Dolphin. We'll start with an easier game like Alien Hominid, running with the OpenGL graphics backend and at native resolution. And it seems to run just fine. So let's move on to one of the hardest games, F-Zero GX. And as you can see here, it's running at about 30 to 35 frames per second. So to me, this is unplayable. Let's switch over to the Vulcan backend and see how that fares. So definitely better, this is about 40 to 45 frames per second. And to me, this is right on the cusp of being playable. So overall, on this phone, I did find that the Vulcan backend did play better with GameCube, much like how it does on the PSP. Some games do have a little bit of stuttering when they're first rendering a new 3D graphic, especially when it comes to like Metroid Prime, but after you've been playing it for a few minutes, it's typically very easy to play. And performance on Mario Kart Wii was pretty good, it's about like what it is with F-Zero GX. So if you're willing to live with that much slowdown, you could do it with Mario Kart 2. But other games like Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, to me, were unplayable. It spends a lot of time loading new shaders anytime you do a new move. And for a fighting game in particular, this is pretty disruptive. So there are various Dolphin emulators available, and I found that one of the best ones for low-powered systems is Dolphin MMJR. But as you can see here, unfortunately it actually runs worse than the regular one. Not only does it have slowdown with other games that don't have slowdown on the official Dolphin emulator, but there's some graphical issues as well. So in general, the official Dolphin emulator seems to run best with this phone. Real quickly, let's talk about some other systems here. Nintendo DS plays just fine. There's no issues here. You can run it at a higher resolution and you're going to have a full frame rate with no frame skip. And you could also load up RetroArch and play your games this way as well. So for example, here I'm playing Dreamcast with a Flycast core with widescreen hacks on. And this is also upscaled to 1080p and it's still running just fine. So if you wanted to have a central hub for all of your games, you're actually going to be able to use RetroArch for a lot of this. And of course any 8-bit and 16-bit systems, things like Game Boy Advance, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, they're going to play just fine. And of course other systems like PlayStation are going to play fine too. So let's do a quick test of a Nintendo emulation. I'm just going to pick a game at random here, something I've never played before. So here we are with a channel first of whatever this game is here. And it seems to run pretty nicely. And it feels a little bit familiar as well. But rather than talk about obscure games that you may have played during your childhood, let's show off a game that everybody's played, like Shadowgate. And this one runs at a full frame rate, no problem. It's a very action heavy game, but as you can see, it's playing just fine. Okay, let's test out game streaming. We'll start with Google Stadia. Now this one plays just fine, which is a little bit surprising to me because I live in Hawaii, which is not officially supported by Stadia, but it works okay. One thing I should add, if you want to change out your theme and your layout of your phone without having to get really involved in a bunch of different front ends, then I recommend ATV Launcher Pro. This launcher will basically turn all of your apps into just a bunch of tiles and makes it easy to navigate through. And then you can also hide the ones you don't want to use. So moving along with streaming here, let's try out Parsec, which allows you to connect to your PC and play from there. And so here I am running the Wii U emulator through my PC onto the phone, and it's running like a dream. Now the phone comes preloaded with a bunch of games here, and honestly I didn't really try them out because they're not emulation related. But yeah, this is what the phone looks like in terms of layout, and obviously you can use the ATV Launcher Pro to improve that experience slightly, and then you could use a front end like Dig or the Reset Collection and really get into the weeds with it. So let's test out HDMI out and see if you could use this as basically a portable console. And well, it doesn't work, so that's not an option. Now, as I mentioned before, it does have a dedicated game mode. And basically all this is, is an app that works as its own front end. So then you could curate your apps and determine which ones you actually want to see on that front page. So I could see this being somewhat handy if you wanted to use this as just a regular old phone, but then wanted a gaming experience when you're ready to play games. You can basically just pop in and out of all your different games all at once. So yeah, overall, as a mid-range phone, I would say this is fairly okay. And you know, it would probably be fairly impressive if you didn't look at the other competition you have available. For example, let's take the Google Pixel 3 or the Google Pixel 3 XL. Now personally, I bought a Google Pixel 3 a couple months ago for about $115 on eBay. But you could get the 3 XL for under $200, and this is going to be about the same size as the phone we're reviewing here. So these Google Pixel phones range from price from half to two thirds of the price of the Blackview BL5000. But as you can see on the spec sheet, the performance of the Snapdragon 845 is quite a bit better than the Dimensity 700. 
And another factor I really love about the Google Pixel 3 is that it has two front firing speakers. So when you're using this in a horizontal mode like this, the sound is actually incredible. By contrast, the BL5000 only has sound coming out of one side of the phone. And in terms of emulation, the Snapdragon 845 is much better. You can see here it can run PSP upscaled to 4x at 1080p with zero frame skip and at a steady 60 frames per second. And I've mentioned the Odin Lite a couple times now, which already runs the Dimensity 900 chip, which performance-wise also seems to look a lot better than the Dimensity 700. But the most compelling thing about the Odin Lite is one, it already comes with built-in controls, and two, the price ranges on this between $175 and $200. Even if you upgrade with more RAM, internal storage, and battery, you're still looking at a device that runs for under $300 with controls already built in. Okay, so let's move on to the summary piece of this video. Let's start with the things I like about this device. Overall, I think that the price for this phone at $300 is a somewhat palatable price. Personally, I'm the kind of guy who buys a new phone like every five or six years and usually will pay something like $1,000 for it. So to me, a $300 phone does seem a little bit enticing. And sure enough, this phone is definitely rugged. You don't need a case for it. And if you happen to be one of these people who actually will throw their phone when they're angry with it, or you have a spouse who likes to drop it into fish bowls, this might have you covered. And in terms of performance, I think that PSP, GameCube, Nintendo 64, and Dreamcast are fairly decent. Same thing with Android games. Overall, I think as a mid-range phone, you're probably going to enjoy the gaming experience with these systems in Android games. The battery life is fairly impressive. This is definitely an all-day battery. The display itself is fairly saturated, and it's fairly impressive as you're looking at it. And I really didn't get into it with this video, but it does do phone stuff. So if you're looking for a new phone, this might be a good compromise. So let's take a minute now and discuss the things I don't like about this phone. Number one, despite the fact that the price is somewhat palatable, you can definitely find better stuff out there on the used marketplace. And I think the Google Pixel 3s are an excellent example of that. Unfortunately, because of its bulky size, you're not able to use USB-C controllers like my GameSir X2. So you're going to be stuck with Bluetooth controllers. Luckily, Bluetooth isn't too bad on this. And while most GameCube games seem to play fairly well, there are several that don't. And anything beyond that, I think, are definitely not possible on this phone. And sadly, this phone is somewhat ugly, especially when you look at the back of it. It's definitely not a phone that I would pull out of my pocket and show off to people to impress them. Not that I really do that with phones, but you know what I mean. I think the user interface on this phone is a little bit gaudy. I've never really been interested in things that are supposed to appeal to gamers because I think design-wise, most times people will miss the mark. And in this case, I think they did as well. It's just not a very pretty interface. Luckily, you could use things like other front ends to cover that up. And unfortunately, there is no stereo sound. I'm sure there's actually stereo speakers at the single side of the phone where sound comes out. But in this day and age, most people are expecting sound to come out of both sides of the phone to give you that stereo experience. And finally, probably the biggest thing for me is this phone doesn't have any distinguishing traits. As you can see on this screen here, there's a lot of compromises with this phone. And I wish I could say that there's some aspect of this phone that compensates for the kind of underwhelming parts of the rest of the phone. But unfortunately, this is just a phone that does a lot of things pretty well and nothing at the level of what I would consider to be excellent. So yeah, that's about it for this review. Honestly, I just wanted to give you a quick assessment of what I found with this phone. And unfortunately, even though I was excited about the prospect of checking out a Dimensity chipset, I think that this particular chipset, the Dimensity 700, really isn't up to snuff when it comes to actually gaming on this phone. And as much as the marketing wants to say that this is a gaming phone, I would respectfully disagree. I think it's okay for Android gaming, so it's a cell phone gaming phone. But when it comes to retro handheld emulation, the things that are my cup of tea, my bread and butter, unfortunately, they just don't hit the mark. So if you're in the market for a new phone and you have a spouse who has a propensity for throwing things into fish bowls, this might be the phone for you. For everybody else, I would say check out the used phone marketplace and see how the going rates are on Google Pixel 3 or similar Snapdragon phones. As always, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.